swing with the camera. Hooray! Okay, I'm Dan Bailman. I'm president of the Linux Users Group. Uh, I use Debian quite a bit, and I use CentOS and uh, derivatives, and I work for a large uh, IT organization here in Jacksonville. I want. I, I used to run, uh, or was one of the board members, and, and used to kind of I used to run the uh, Jax or uh, Jax hacks. There's so many Jax entities. <laughs> you do run the Jax library. Oh well, yeah, yeah, sure. But uh, there's so many Jax entities. So uh, Jax hacks was uh, our local hacker space, and uh, ran that for four years, and then we ran it right into the ground. And <laughs> It's hard to get people kind of motivated to uh, do things in Jacksonville. And one of the things that I really enjoyed doing at the Hackerspace was I built a server that did a lot of services. It um, allowed people to boot from it so you could do uh, uh, pixie booting, uh, you could do rescue images, you could boot uh, distros, you can try different Linuxes, you could. We even had guest servers that would boot off of them and then load the guest image right into this. <coughs> um, there were file services. There was all kinds of neat things that I built into this service that you could plug into the LAN or get on the wireless LAN and it would provide you with all these services. And we, while we don't have the space anymore, I was thinking that one of the things that the Jacksonville tech communities are kind of lacking is something to kind of play with. So every time I go to like the 2600 group, which you guys should, you guys should all go to the D-Log 2600 group to hack at FSCJ. They're all great groups. They're a lot of fun. Um, but every time I go to any of the groups, they're more mostly you know centered on talking about tech or socializing, one of the two. And I wanted to try to you know. I like playing with tech. I, I want to I I sit there and do stuff with them. All right, that's, that's my fun, I, and I enjoy playing with them. So I can build a little portable server. It's kind of neat. And uh, it was a fun project, and some people on the internet said, like, you know, hey, well, you know, why not just use a laptop? I did that. And I also carried around a certain suitcase, a literal suitcase, of cables and an access point and a switch. And extra hard drives, and like and 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 and, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, and then I, uh, I I brought it down, and I got it to be the size of a wall. Um, Was that wall? Well, 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 eventually <laughs> yes. But uh, I got it down to be a uh, Raspberry Pi, and then I got it down to be a uh, Odroid. <clears throat> and uh, it was a, a cluster of material. I should have downloaded the picture for that material, but I'll put it up on this uh, on this wiki later on. But uh, the cluster of material is about four times the size of that box. And now, I could fit all of that in my backpack. It was kind of a challenge, but I could fit all of it in my backpack. Uh, because like a lot of it was like the power bricks and all the like power cables, and I had to get a big extension cable and all this kind of stuff. Because everything had its own little power brick and all that kind of stuff. And now, I've got it to I have one power down, a single power down. So that's what I'm, I was trying to accomplish. I'm making a box that is something that is neat for me to make, that's neat to show off, that's something that we can use to do all kinds of neat stuff. So I can bring a services box, sit it down, and we can have services we can all play with. We can sit there and I can have an IRC server, I can have an FTP server, I can have a boot server. I can have whatever. I can put all kinds of stuff. And so I actually have uh, all that material on this. So I'm going to try to run through this as fast as I can because there is a ton of material that I put into this presentation. I actually, I didn't make slides. I tried to finish the wiki. <laughs> okay? And the wiki's not even really fully done. Like, this is going to be a rolling project. I'm actually going to make a B size presentation. I'm actually thinking about putting this as when I hopefully get it more finished. Maybe a DEF CON presentation. Actually, bigger bear is coming up and they call called Rangers. Oh, that would be fun. So you can actually do a talk if you want to do a presentation. Okay. Well, presentation slots. 
and we can do that with a bunch of things. And there's, there's like 12 terabytes of rainbow tables on that one as well, which are also really good. But again, it's 12 terabytes. It's a lot of data. All right? So you can use that for a variety of things. If I want to distribute ISOs, we've done that with uh, like Kali Linux. We go to a security thing, people want to try out different stuff, play with stuff. Hey, everybody's connecting to this poor little access point at the college or something, and it's just like coming down at like 56K. That's terrible. <laughs> or you can download it at Gigabit. Yeah. So that's why you have a file server. And then potentially later on, I'd like to see if I can build some kind of thing. I can't figure out what technology there is because I haven't really played with peer to peer pretty much at all. But I have to figure out, like maybe if like anybody has any suggestions later on, we can talk. But a peer to peer um, service that is cross platform that I could be like, I could set it up where this thing hosts and then people can connect and, and trade files so that I don't have to put all the files on here. And that way, like, hey, I need this version of Linux. Well, I got it. Well, here, and then just boop, pop it up onto that, and you can transfer it over, or like a couple of people need it, and that way I don't have to sit there and be like, okay, I'll grab it, I put it on there, let me, all right, I'll put it and host it, and that way it makes things a lot more fluid. So I have to still kind of figure out what I want to do there, but it's kind of a potential thing. Uh, do you have a question? Uh, I have a couple of questions. A whole bunch of them. Are you talking like an ad hoc, like SuperNet mesh? Network type capabilities? No. no. No, this is literally peer to peer uh, program. Like, think, okay. think like, uh, uh, like Net, uh, Napster. Right. Like Napster. Yeah, okay. yeah like the, the old Napster. Like or LimeWire. Yeah, you want to go real back. Like one that's not nefarious and full of like viruses right. so and bugs and crazy. Like a mesh network. I don't know. Like, shares. What's that? Like a mesh network where everybody kind of just follows. Well, it's, it's a peer to peer network. Yeah. A mesh network is very something very specific. It deals yeah. with wireless networks. But we got to deal with salt. Yeah. Well, we'll, well, we can talk about that offline, trying to figure out what, what, what a good uh, technology is for that. Because I want to find something that's open, that is available for, that's open and still developed, and something that's not going to be riddled with viruses and all kinds of craziness. And it doesn't have to be very complex or like performance. Why or anything like that. It's just simple. Like that. Um, also, future, I'd like to see an IRC or some other local chat server that exists there, and that way people can sit there and chat on it. And that way, if we have a problem with the internet access or something, and we're doing like, a, especially like a, a Linux install fest or something, where people can sit there and chat with each other, and that, I have this problem. Case. Boom. There you go. Here's all this thing. That way we don't deal with like limits on the pace, size, speed, all that kind of stuff. Boom. There you go. You can flood it. It's whatever. It's local. It's great. Uh, and then a proxy for gaming OS services. I've done this in my house. It runs fantastic. Uh, I don't think this will be really probably used as much for a gaming uh, like a like a hub, but um, OS service updates it really works well for. So like if you uh, go over and you have like a lot of Windows updates or something like that, they fetch from the same servers or they fetch from the same server clusters and they have a lot of stuff. And going in and trying to save bandwidth on that a lot of times helps out if you're doing a lot of the same stuff. And so it helps out sometimes. And I, I've done that and it's, it helped out at my house a lot. Uh, I think uh, like during the, over the uh, holidays, uh, Blizzard was having some problems. I think we downloaded um, uh, Diablo 3, and I want to say like 12 hours for the first guy, and then the second guy downloaded it in like 20 minutes. So it's like an Nginx uh, backend with a bunch of it's, it's neat. So maybe, maybe not, uh, we'll see how useful it might be. But maybe other stuff, but that's kind of the usage of the phone. So, hardware. Uh, we'll kind of go over it real fast. We'll just kind of blow through this as fast as I can because there's a lot of stuff going over. All right, knock off have Kroger Freight Pelican Casey. I got it for seven dollars. They're gonna sell that thing for cheap. <laughs> Great. Uh, I didn't. I love Pelican Crazies. I got one right there. Those things were fantastic. They're expensive. I took a <laughs> drill of that thing as soon as I got it. I'm not buying one of those and taking a drill and going wee. No, uh, that's not gonna happen. So. If nothing else, proof of concept, now I got a bunch of holes in it, now I can go buy one of those. But 
it works out fine. So uh, that was seven dollars. I think the uh, normal price is uh, fourteen. Uh, Odroid XU4. Now the Odroid XU4 actually has um, there. There's a new Odroid coming out in probably I don't know four or six months. They they announced it. It's they got a picture of the first uh, revision of it. Uh, it looks really cool. It's going to prevent you from having to do some of this stuff, like the SATA adapt adapters, some of the 12 volt regulators, some of the stuff you won't have to do if you're building one of these. So if you can wait like six or six or eight months, you might want to wait for that board. I don't know. I have this board. This is what I have. It works great. This is a fantastic project for this thing. It fits great. That board's going to be bigger. I don't know. Um, but you can look it up, see what you want to do with that. I'm using the EMMC card. The EMMC card, I believe, is the same technology as an SD card, but the interface is different. It's a lot faster. Like, a lot, 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 lot faster. All right? I would very much suggest that you use an EMMC over an SD card, especially if you're trying to comply with things. All right? Uh, these things, the uh, TLWN722N, uh, I bought two version 3 cards because I thought to myself, they've been out for a couple of years and I'm really good at Linux and I can figure this out with the people and like, they, they, they all these drivers and you know, I'm, gonna, I'm doing this from Gen 2 and there's all this support and all this. We'll figure this out, I'll put it up on the wiki, it's going to be great. Three weeks later and smashing my face into a pole, I threw those on the edge of the desk, and now we have a micro uh, in the middle and a version one sitting there. That's one I pulled out of one of my bags. Uh, so don't buy the V3s or probably the V2s. They are terrible. Uh, I, I believe it's the RTL8188 EU chipset. I have the, uh, the actual identifier for the one that I had uh, later on. There is a way of getting this to work, but you have to use a very old version of host APD. And by very old, I mean uh, we're using version like two point something. The version that they hacked together is point eight. Okay, so ancient. <laughs> so it's, I would stay away from those. I'm going to try to figure out something that will be better. It'll probably be um, a, uh, I've never used one of them before, but uh, all the years, something like that. Uh, but I'll figure something out with that. I have two wireless cards. One is the client, one is the access point. They can't be at the same at the same time. Um, fan for airflow. Uh, the Lenovo Advanced Plug to Square Plug. Sacrifice that for power. Uh, SATA, the USB, and with USAP support for better uh, USB support for speed. Um, that's your USB to SATA uh, adapter. Uh, a couple of uh, 12 volt regulators to bring our power in. I'll go over that a little bit later. And 5 volt regulators to bring our power in for 5 volts. Um, and then USB 2, I actually had to move down to USB 2 because I had designed this differently, but it ended up that what I had designed and the USB 3 cables I did did not work. It was very strange. And I'm only going to be taking those cables apart to see if they have a nice little chip in them that's spying on me from China. <laughs> All right, so power. This is the power design. Uh, the way I figured out the power is I figured out what each one of the hard drives required uh, from general idea of hard drive usage. Hard drives, as a rule of thumb, a 3.5 inch hard drive needs 25 watts to run, maximum. Okay. That was correlated with the little bricks that came with my uh, SATA controllers. SATA controller bricks were around 25 watts. They're, they were like 26 watts or like 24 watts or something like that. So, at Blue, they have a 12 volt 2.2 amp, which is about 25 watts, thereabouts. And so, these guys, I actually looked up the, the specs on, they, they're way lower than that for their normal running, but these guys went great, so 12 volts, 2.2 amps, 12 volts, 2.2 amps, and then to run my 5 port switch, my Odroid, my 60 milliliter fan, I did a 5 volt, 6 amp uh, converter. Now that's actually kind of overkill. I would probably, uh, the Odroid actually needs 4 amps, 
it requires less, but to push that power over to USB to use for USB devices, it sacrifices some of that power to, to give to the USB devices and other things. Also, when you're going full tilt, like compiling and stuff, and everything, you know, you're, you're really using a lot of power. Plus, it has a little fan on it and whatnot. And then the go switch uses a minimal amount of power, so does the uh, fan. But I went ahead and opted for the larger uh, voltage transformer just to kind of give myself a little bit of headroom on the 5 volt bus. These together equal about 80 watts. Now, I was looking around my house and I'm like, hey, when do I have this 80 watts? Because I have bricks all over my house. And I have a IBM ThinkPad brick. I have a lot of IBM ThinkPads. They're great little machines. There's an IBM ThinkPad sitting on my desk right now, right here. And I have, an 80, 80, I have several 90 watt bricks, big ones. Pretty thick. I mean, there's one sitting on the desk right there if you want to see it. And 90 watts is bigger than 80 watts. Great. All right. Now, that gives us an overhead. That overhead may be eaten up by the inefficiencies of these. This is the output. Okay? That means that the input may be bigger than the output because there is an inefficiency in the conversion. Now, these are very efficient. They're like 93% efficient, depending on how much power you're drawing out of them. But I do have a 10 watt overhead if they're at maximum draw. Now, they should never be at maximum draw, but I have that if I need it. So, great. I mean, I could probably run this to the 60 watt and be fine, but yeah. All right. So, that's our power. So, just out of curiosity, yeah. not knowing a ton about uh, electronics, but if you did the 60 watt yeah. and you were true, what would be the effect of the uh, the brick would provide you with as much as it could, and then it would fault in some way. So either it would provide you with 60 watts and then just stop. So it would continue to provide you with 60 watts, and that's as much as it would provide you. And the devices would just stop receiving. They, they would receive 60 watts. And so you would basically have a brownout scenario. Or the brick would fail in some way. I.e., it would basically, you're shorting the brick, you're trying to draw more than it's, it's trying to, uh, it's designed to provide. And in that case, it may have a, uh, a fuse or something else internal, and you might fry the brick. So it depends on what you're trying to do. You're, you would run into a bad situation. You need to make sure that your, your source stream um, is overbuilt, basically. It's always, it, it walks down the street. But it's a good question. What type of hard drive are you using? What's that? What type of hard drive are you using? Well, you can use pretty much any hard drive, but I'm using, uh, right now, I have a uh, 4 terabyte Western Digital Gold drive, which is a data center level drive, and a 8 terabyte Western Digital Red drive. I would prefer to have two gold drives because I like the, uh, the, um, the data center level drives. They're a little bit more uh, hefty. They're a little bit, they got a little bit more uh, they build a little bit better, they're able to test a little bit better, they actually have multiple controllers on them, that kind of thing. They're a little bit more reliable. Uh, SSDs? I mean, SSDs are very expensive and they're very small. Especially right now. I have 12 terabytes in there. If I wanted to do that in SSD, <laughs> I would be out of a lot of money. <laughs> like, I, got, I bought that 8 terabyte for $160. Like, you do if I wanted to do 8 terabytes of SSDs, I would like to buy that for $160. <laughs> if you wish to donate SSD, he's welcome to take it. Yes. Yeah, plus we'll get If you have a pile of SSDs, I'll take them. And I'll make something cool out of them. It seems like it's cool. To be clear, it's not a dump. Yes, it, it is actually full. And, and yeah, there's more that you want to put on there. Yes, I, I actually, it, there's, I'm actually leaving out about a four terabyte chunk because I don't have enough. How many uh, SATA ports do you have? Do you right, well, right now this is two, but we'll we'll get to that oh, as separate. Uh, yeah. Do you have another? One? No. Okay. I got one more. Yes. Are you worried about the uh, the two hard drives interfering each other with magnets? Um, no. Uh, usually they're. Very well insulated, but also you can stack hard drives right, pretty much right on top. Yeah. 
each other, and they're isolated uh, inside of their uh, cases. Okay. I don't know about uh, magnetic resonance much, I and mean, there probably is like mm -hmm. scientific papers on that, so you might want to look that up. I don't know personally, yeah. but in like servers and whatnot, you'll actually see them very commonly stacked directly right on top of each other. So, that, that or side by side, a hot swap. Because yeah. that, that, they're like, they're, they're touching each other. Yeah. 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 So mine are, mine are upside down from one another. Yeah. So it is different than most other configurations, but I did look up the configurations that um, or people, I could just, because people have questions on Reddit, and they're like, hey, you're on the big upside down. Is that okay? And I'm like, let's go look. Yeah. And so I went and I uh, looked up a, uh, our article, and one of the Seagate articles said, you can, like, there was a couple of, like, Western Digital was like, Mac, whatever. Maxer was like, well, you can do, you know, these configurations, but really it doesn't matter. And Seagate's like, you can do this, 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 this. But really, at the end of the day, meh, just don't shake it when you're running it. Yeah. And one of the things is, uh, a lot of people on the internet, when I did post this to Reddit, which we'll get to later on if you can, uh, they were saying, why didn't you use SSDs? SSDs are great. They are fantastic. They run cooler. They're faster. They don't have all kinds of like momentum issues. They have much less power requirements. I don't have to do it by a lot of power. They don't generate a lot of heat. Smaller. They're fantastic. It depends on your space. Actually, these are a lot more power. Or these are a lot denser than SSDs are. Yeah. For what I get for. Right. For what you get for. Now, if I could go buy one of those 30 terabytes that, I, that Samsung just released, I would do two of those and get 60 terabytes in my face. Oh, there we go. I don't know. Right. How much were those? I don't know. They, they, really say, uh, they have not yet released the price. Yes, it's, they're very expensive, I'm sure. But they're, they're, they're enterprise level. They're SAS drives. They're not SATA drives. I don't think I can buy a USB to SAS of that. So, uh, moving on, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the pictures of the build real quick, and then we'll go into the operating system yeah. code itself. This is the uh, parts. Now these are kind of, uh, most of the parts, a lot of these parts have gotten switched, or some of these parts have gotten switched out. Um, uh, power brick, here's our uh, wireless adapters that have gotten switched out. This is our switch. Uh, it's sitting on its case. Let's see, maybe Click the original phone. Yeah. Well, it's, I'll just do it for this one because it's got a lot of information on it. <laughs> this is a great soldering iron, by the way. Or it has those clips. Also, when I get a better client interface, when I don't have a tiny, tiny, tiny uh, wireless LAN literally wedged in between two hard drives. <laughs> Which we learned is not a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> the internet is bad. I actually thought about uh, clipping it. Actually, I will clip it right now. And uh, This antenna right here is the client, right? Or this is the actual no, that's, that's, that's what you guys can that's got a much better interface. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. So just, no. just throw this out here. I've got a little seat for you. Samsung 15 terabyte SAS drive for $11,000. There you go. Seven so, oh. generations now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the other, the other problem with SSDs right now is they're uh, being Take impacted by the DRAM shortage. Uh, so they're about. It's good enough. It's working. So they're about three times as much as they were a year ago. It's working. So all right. So uh, these are the hard drive. Uh, these are the hard drives sitting on top. Of, or the hard drive adapters uh, sitting on top of their cases, but they still have the uh, power adapters uh, built on them. This guy. This is all the originals before I started taking components off of this stuff. Um, these are your 12-volt uh, Bach transformers. Bach means that they go down. They only go down. You can't go up with them. So if, it, if you provide it with 10 volts, it can't do anything with that. It can only provide 10 volts. But if you provide it with 30 volts, it can provide 12 volts. Its range is, uh, you have to look it up on the blue site, but I believe it's around 12 volts to 35 volts. The same thing with the 5 volt, which is this guy, it's bigger. 
it's 5 volts to about 35 to 36 volts. This is the O-Droid with the original fan. The fans on the O-Droid are annoying and loud, so I replaced it with a heat sink, a really big heat sink. The heat sink does not do enough. The fan is loud, but it's really good at cooling it off. So, eh, um, I bought a battery. The battery is great for the real-time clock, so it actually keeps time. That is very annoying. If you know, you know, anybody that has ever dealt with a Raspberry Pi, ever, <laughs> knows what I'm talking about. Buy the battery. <laughs> these cables, don't buy these, they're terrible. <laughs> this, Unless uh, it's a data store, and then... Yeah. This, uh, <laughs> This, uh, this Anker uh, USB 3 thing, I tried to do the drives from these. It kind of, uh, it was having problems with it, so I decided to pull the drives directly into the Android instead. And I'm using the USB 2 bus to power my um, uh, wireless. And that seems to be working pretty great. Uh, hard drives, case, various colors of wire. I very much suggest using different colors of wire to denote your different things. So right now I'm using uh, white for 20 volt, uh, yellow for 12 volt, red for 5 volt, and black for ground. What is uh, what? Oh, What's that? <laughs> also, DSA, figure out what one thing you need to Right. Does that say 22 gauge uh, wire? Uh, yes, 22. 22? 32 of you. Like, non existent. I don't think it actually, like, I think that's smaller than that uh, exists. So it might wearing, be like watch watch things. I don't know. Yes. If you're wearing danger of exploding, which part will be? I thought they're not there. Uh, I mean, if that thing is trying to explode, I don't know. Maybe move to a different state because everything's exploding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like that doesn't have any explosive. So, like if that's exploding, you might want to watch out for the table. Like you might come and get you. Uh, so next. These, this is a close-up of the hard drive. One's, one's uh, pinned in, so this is when I had it soldered in. This is before I got rid of the uh, node. So this is uh, where you plug it in. So you plug in the data here, you plug in your, uh, your uh, power right here, and then you have your power uh, soldered in after the fact. Did you buy those or did you put them in? I bought these. So I bought these, they cost about 20 bucks a piece. Uh, then I just took a, a, a tool, a sharp tool, shove it in there and they, they just kind of wiggle apart. Uh, they're just two clamp shell halves and I popped them apart and that's the board and then uh, I had to desolder it. Now this was a pain in the butt. What I did is I went in and I plugged it in, made sure it worked before I started. That is a huge, huge thing. <laughs> if, you, if you are hacking on something, we're always check before you take it apart, does this thing work? Because it, when you when it doesn't, when, not yet, when it doesn't, did I break it? Rules of troubleshooting, try the simplest thing first. Right. Is there, that's your SATA ports right there? These are the SATA cable. Yeah, so it's SATA USB power. Does it have enough power to run, like, say, a SATA Y cable and go ahead and potentially four hard drives? No. no, not at all. Wood power? No. Also, a lot also of you can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> That's not how SATA works. SAS yeah. works that way. I thought it was working. They're dating. They're dating. This is the SATA data here. What? Okay. So well, it's like a manufacturer specific thing. Uh, as far as I know, you shouldn't be able to do that because it's a uh, SATA is a uh, is a serial, and so it's direct as opposed to parallel, which is chainable. But uh, I mean, I could be wrong. I I am common, I, I'm wrong from time to time, and I look stuff up. That's why we look stuff up. That's why we're there. A lot, a lot of the, a lot of the rules for SCSI is applied to SATA. Right. Because they're derivative. SATA is a sub, kind of subset of SCSI. Google has said no. You are, you are correct. Right okay. So. Uh, but, it was probably power. But, power. but if nothing else, the power of these things is very, very close to the quote rule of thumb power that you would have for hardware. So if you did two. It would be really like you'd have to like try to do one and then the other, and then it might brown out the first one. And like, yeah, it's because you're spinning up a hard drive and it's trying to spin it up really fast. 
until you might spike that power out. And so, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, if you hooked up four SSDs in this baby, they take a lot less power. I have, I have a USB to say that, too, that make those adapters and their power. Mm -hmm. yeah. yep. yeah. Well, that's that. So, uh, here we have both of them uh, actually penned out, and I just took some uh, liquid tape. And uh, can you guys see that? Yeah. I just took some liquid tape and uh, kind of went over the edges just to make sure that I wasn't getting any uh, power contact with just random stuff. Now I know I know this thing's covered in contacts, but I don't want 12 volts just kind of like willy nilly running around in the case, you know. <laughs> so I went ahead and covered those at least. The next thing is the O droid itself. Now this is after I actually put the um, the passive cooler on it, uh, and this is when I was running it off of an SD card. I had an SD card, I built it with an SD card because I thought my uh, EMC uh, card reader was broken. Uh, it, I don't know, it might still be, it might actually be broken, I don't know, I haven't used it since, but I built it on the SD card and then I moved the data over to the MMC, well I copied the data over to the MMC, did some magic, and now it's on the MMC. So that's what an Odroid looks like with that stuff on there. It's a great little box. You can have them for, for $60, so a little bit better than double the, a little bit less than double the price. What's that? What so, shape is it on it? This is a, uh, I don't know, I, I think the... It's a big 442 Exynos Samsung. It's a, um, I got it later on in the kernel config. Uh, but it's basically, it's a, 8 core processor, 2 gigs of DDR3 memory, 8 cores, it's a big little processor, 4 cores are 1.4 gigahertz, 4 cores are 2 gigahertz. Uh, it's able to do gigabit and USB 3 and USB 2, um, and it's got uh, some other stuff on it. It's got 4 Cortex A15, yep. 2 gigahertz, <laughs> yeah. and a Cortex A7. Okay, this is our uh, 5 volt bug transformer with our 20 volts in. And our five volts out. See how our coloring makes a big difference here? Because if I set this aside and they're white and black on both sides and I didn't like draw on it, would I know which side's which? Yes. I'd have to turn it over. I'd have to turn it over. But if I glued it to the board, or glued it to the box, no. I'd have to sit there with a hole. What's that? Yeah. Lick it. One side, one side would smoke. Um, okay, this is my, uh, this is the bottom view of the uh, six gigabit, or the, the, uh, the gigabit, uh, six gigabit. Hey, that's crazy. Um, so I had, uh, I took a cable, I sacrificed it, cut it in half, stripped all the cables out. These are tiny cables. All these things are a pain in the butt to solder. Holy mackerel, these things are a pain in the butt to solder. Also, these little leads, I took the traces off accidentally. Very pain in the butt to take the leads off of these things. Holy mackerel, this thing took me like an hour and a half, two hours to do it. Um, and they short like crazy. So, <laughs> pain in the butt. But suffice to say, I desoldered these pins um, and kind of took out some of these traces accidentally. Um, and uh, desoldered this, which is the power. Soldered the power in, soldered these things in. And then I had to, uh, I had a shorting issue with the data. This thing protects itself, so when it detects a shorting issue in the data cable, it will just reset. Um, and so it was resetting. I've tried to figure that out. I eventually hot glued in between all the leads. I picked up the cable, hot glued in between all the leads to try to prevent that, let it, let it uh, cool off, rest the cable down, try it again. Still didn't have, still had the same problem, pull the hot glue off. Hot glue, by the way, great thing to use in electronics. Fantastic, but it didn't work in this case, so what I did is I took some gap tape and made little flags, and just kind of pushed those all the way down to the base of them, and that worked fine. So, that worked out great. That's the top of it. I whittled off the top of this guy so I could get to all of the uh, traces that were sticking out. Uh, but the reason I didn't take off the entire thing is on the bottom, which I already closed, you can't see it anymore, but on the bottom, it's got two pens, two plastic pens, 
one's on this side, one's on this side, that holds the whole thing in. Now, it is also held in by the data cables annoyingly well, but I didn't want, I want that physical structure of that plastic to be holding onto it, so I left that on there. Uh, then, this is my hard drive hole guide. I, I, I looked up on the internet for a while to try to find one that I could print out, and you know, those all failed. So what I did, I took a hard drive, put it on a piece of paper, traced it, cut it, turned it over, poked holes through it, stuck it on there. Done. All right. That's, and, I, and I wrote where the connector is. Cool. All right. Take a pencil, scribble in where I'm drawing the holes, draw the holes done. That's where the holes are. It's kind of a bad picture, but. Then, one of my air holes, so I made my air holes, I took the drill, dragged it across. So I, what I did is I drilled eight holes where I wanted the, the slots to basically start and end, and then I just took the drill and kind of slowly dragged it between the two holes. Uh, trying not to destroy myself at the same time. <laughs> uh, this would probably be done well with the Dremel, which I have, but I just have no idea where all the bits are. <laughs> yeah, and there's the outside. Now this looks kind of crappy. Eventually what I did is I took uh, some uh, basically sandpaper, some iron sandpaper, and just cut a strip of it, put it through the slot, and then knocked the edges. Works great. Uh, here, I wanted to cut a slot for the uh, fan, so I took the fan, put it on a piece of paper, same as the hard drive, traced it out, cut it out, put the fan back down, traced out the inside and the holes for the screws, put it on the side of the thing. Then, I took a punch, set it down, and hammered for each one of the holes I wanted to drill, and then I drilled all the holes. And then I took a bigger drill, and I countersunk those holes a little bit just to get all those, just to knock those edges. And then I had a fan uh, guard. It's great. This is how I made a ship. The, the, uh, the O droid and the uh, uh, switch were too tall for my case. The way that I had to orient them, because I'm sitting there trying, basically, I'm making a puzzle. A puzzle that nobody else has ever made. And so, I had to sit there and try to figure out how to put all these pieces into this non-conformal case. And I, I, I mean, it's one o'clock in the morning, Ace is not open, I can't, Ace is not in place right now unless I want to be a thief. And I can't use any, like I, I don't really want to go to Walmart and I'm like, what can I use around my house? I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think. I have, uh, some some stock aluminum. I got like this one inch by like uh, it was like four millimeter thick. I could probably cut that, but it's four millimeters thick. It's kind of thick. It's very heavy duty. It's too heavy for what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to think of like plastic would be nice because it's not conductive. If it gets in there, then it wouldn't really mess with anything. That's great, but I don't have any plastic that's really like heavy duty like that. Wood would be all right, but it would be too thick again. Metal is really the kind of the best thing, but what can I use? And I'm sitting there walking around the house, walking around the house, like, what else do I have? 3D printer. I could 3D print it, but I'd have to get the 3D printer working again. Also, the 3D printer ah. materials are not very strong, and I'm trying to get something that can be kind of slammed up in the at jam of this thing. No, but that's a great idea. The 3D printer would probably work great. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I figured out a long time ago, I had gone shooting. And I was like, oh, well, I'll collect the brass and maybe I'll go refill them at some point. And eventually I abandoned that because it's apparently it's a pain in the butt to refill the 556. And then, like, the head of it's really thin and it's just a pain in the butt and it's not really worth it. So I just kind of sat on a case of brass there. And I'm just like, hey, hey, I wonder if I can use that. And so I uh, took that, I cut the butt off. And uh, just what I did is I put it in a vise, and I took a hacksaw, and I cut off its butt. And I had a hammer! <laughs> and so I just took it, and uh, smushed it, and I took it and I threw it into the, uh, into the uh, drill press. Put two holes in it, and boom, there you go, chips. And they work great. They're really thin, but they're really strong. They work fantastic. They're right the right length and, and it's great for 
There you go. That's 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 some hacker space mentality right there. That's that's what you get from you know going to Jack Sacks a lot. Um, yeah, you just like what what do I have? What what what's just around? What can I use? You probably uh, you could probably make a better heat sink than what you had out of that. I mean, probably. I mean, that's that's pretty heat, good heat. That heat, that heat. But I'd have to make a forge first. Yeah. <laughs> and I've already done that. Hey, you're good. You're you're. I've you're already done, done the whole that. I already did already. that. Come on. Away with the hackers. So. Yeah. All right. So I should yeah, get them used on the switch. I uh, and these are actually hammer marks. They look like thumbprints, but they're actually hammer marks. The hammer I was using is a crossbeam, and I was hammering it onto. Uh, I have a uh, uh, kind of like a micro. Uh, uh, it's basically this. What's that? Handle. Yeah, I like a little micro angle, but it's basically on the back end of my uh, plant. And so uh, I just took this. I'm using plastic standoffs of metal screw, and I put the, the screw through there, and that kind of matched up with the hole I made. You can see the other standoff down here. Um, and so this way, I'm having standoffs that are away from the side of the case, and I can pass cables and things through the back of them. And the edge of the case kind of curves. That doesn't affect this anymore because I'm standing them off. And then also now I can screw them into the top one because I have these shims that are poking up above the top of the case. Um, and then you can see this one's for the, the Odroid. So I just basically what I did is I screwed these in uh, by, uh, I screwed them into the Odroid and then I kind of let them dangle and then I kind of eyed where they would screw in uh, in the case, and then I just kind of I get them in there and then screw them in, put them in. Well, works. Uh, this is the hole for the uh, the power. This is the primary hole. This is where the power connector actually comes out or comes in. Uh, and this this is a clamp. Uh, so this is just using a, uh, a zip tie. And so what I did is I have the power connector poke out here. It's just basically covered in hot snot. Um, which is uh, hot glue, and then what I did is I have uh, the connector, I poked the connector out, I just covered it, the whole inside of it with hot glue, and then I had the, um, uh, the zip tie kind of resting in almost the right place, and right as the hot glue was kind of starting to solidify it, I slowly kind of pulled the uh, thing taut, and now it's all kind of sunk in there and, and very secure. So that way, because that's a physical interface. That's something like, it's just like the switch. I wanted to make sure that I had two points on the switch. That's why I had to have that shim. And this thing, I have to have that hot glue and the physical point so that when I push that connector in, I'm not shoving it into the case. So that's why that's there. This is the uh, cable after I've cut it off. So this is the advanced uh, thick pad cable. Uh, and then over here we have the, uh, <laughs> this is the one that's inside of their, their adapter that I bought. And uh, this is not an IBM or Lenovo product. This is just some Amazon, you know, whatever. Uh, and then I just uh, soldered these together. And so I have three of my cables and three of my cables coming off of these guys. And then those three break out to our uh, power. Uh, our block transformers. There's what the power connector looks like with the hot glue and the uh, cable. That's our five volt first uh, plug in there. I'm just gonna kind of run through these things because we still got a lot of them. With our shim, power, five volt, 12 volt. Here's our first hard drive connector. And this is, the, uh, this is the drill bit I used, and you can see that I kind of countersunk those to keep those from interacting with the fan and then from being kind of sharp on the outside. Here's with the fan. I actually eventually, I think, turned that around uh, and then I also put on a, uh, a fan guard, so it keeps uh, the cables from getting into it. Uh, but this is with the first hard drive uh, cable plugged in there. Uh, that's a good view of the whole case on that side. View from the Odroid with the Odroid with all the power and all this stuff will run over here. So this is fairly complete at this point with all the soldering and everything I had to do uh, in front view. Side view. Alright, 
So for, uh, at this point, I put the hard drive in. I was using this uh, uh, USB hub. Had one of the hard drives in there. These are all just kind of using this thing. This is the first run of it. You can see my little light here. I uh, just take this on here for right now. Keep things from kind of wobbling around, getting rid of the fan and whatnot. I was running it with open, so we didn't have any like EA issues or anything like that. That's uh, when I started mounting the, uh, the top uh, hard drive. These are the mounting holes from the top hard drive. That's what it looks like from the inside. I use grommets, rubber grommets on the bottom to try to. I did that on the bottom hard drive as well, but I basically I was trying to have a, uh, a sponge to allow the hard drive a little bit of travel mm -hmm. to uh, kind of arrest some of the uh, jarring from like if somebody hits the table or something like that. The hard drive will take some of that, but I'm trying to prevent as much as I can. Yeah, you want you want a vibration damping. What's that? The, you want a vibration damping. Right. Uh, this is when I mounted one of the two terabyte ones. Now the tragic thing is, is both my two terabyte and four terabyte had the same mounting holes, but then I bought the eight terabyte. Oh no! And it was uh. not because to heck with standards, and that's what you get. Uh, this is one of the 12 volt transformers, and I still close up with that guy. Uh, there's two browns, and then a hot, and a hot, and so this is the uh, 20 coming in, and the 12 going out. This is with it. Uh, I actually measured out the cable, so basically I, I, I got everything set up with the hard drive there, and, and the, uh, tran or the uh, transformer down there, and I snaked the cable around and tried to figure out where I wanted it to go, and I clipped the cable and went ahead and uh, soldered them in. Uh, this is where all the transformers are put on together. That's the cables. Basically, just jump like that. Top view. Uh, terrible. <laughs> terrible. It's more terrible. They actually look really nice, they, and, it, and it, they worked out perfectly, except for software. <laughs> if it wasn't for the software, these would be great cars. What would the functionality? It would function perfectly. <laughs> they fit in the, the these cables too. They're just they're screwy from every side. This is just terrible. And so like the, uh, it took me a long time to try to figure out. Well, I eventually figured out the cables were bad. That's and to get different cool. cables. And then eventually, like I was working on them, on the, I had to get a new kernel built because I had to get different drivers built because this thing that like the way that I had built this was. Yeah. Explain the cable story real quick. No. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't have time. We don't have time. Uh, we're we're just still in the physical build. We gotta go. We gotta get to Gen two. <laughs> we're not we're not even there yet. Yeah, but right. cables the only thing I'm gonna understand. Hmm? Is it is it electromagnetic interference or, or uh, what? I mean, it looked good. Here's the It's, it's, it's alright. Um, here we got. See this one. This one is where the uh, the other one's sitting in the middle of it. Uh, but. This one works fine if it was if the software worked. And this is these are the cables that lead to the outside. So you can see the little white antenna sitting there. That leads out here, and so that way I'm getting the signal. These are these are isolated cables. They're grounded onto the uh, on the outside of the cable or onto the uh, plane of this guy. And so this signal cable goes through this grounded line, and you can see that it's copper grounded all the way through the line and gets that signal all the way out to the outside of the case before it lets out the signal. That's the whole idea. But the problem is, I have one V1, and you can't really buy one in reliably because you can't tell what's on the inside of the case. And so anybody that says, oh, I'm selling V1s, eh, eh, not really. Uh, the liver change. What's that? The TV liver change. Yeah, TV liver change. Oh, did it? Yeah. It used to be like it's like a normal like font. Now they made that like TP to be fancy. Okay. Well, yeah. I didn't know that. So I will show you. I have a picture of my V1. Is that a V1 versus a V2? Uh, I don't know about the V2. But because the V2s have the same chips. Apparently. The newer one has the like more round five eyes. Similar. What's that? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
These don't work, but their form factor is fantastic. I don't know. We'll figure out something. I'll get back to you. Uh, that's the end of my connectors, the RPSMA. Uh, I, I kind of cantered them a little bit at a 45 degree angle. That way I can set them in multiple uh, directions, allowing for the uh, the cables, or the uh, for the network cables to come out. So I can set them cross like that, set them side by side, or set them side by side the other way. Uh, I wanted to allow for this thing to be rotated or set in whatever direction. There's only cables and whatnot on the two sides. So there's cables and there's your, oh, you're networking on one side with power on the other side. And uh, yeah. that's what the, basically finished at that point. I had to change out a bunch of stuff. So like that one's gone, these cables are gone. This is a different uh, switch now. These things are plugged into that now. These guys are plugged into that side, so it's, it's different, but I'll, I'll get that updated as well. Um, as another full view, it's, it's, it's well packed. Uh, this is when I, uh, it's on the to-go mode, so I just pop it open, throw the cable, or the, uh, the uh, antennas in, and we're good to go. And that's what it looks like packed up. Are these five or 2.4? They're 2.4. Uh, so, I think really isn't that crazy yet in a lot of laptops and older systems. Okay. Two, this laptop only had two more of them. Okay. What's up? The uh, heat. It's pretty good most of the time unless you're like compiling the kernel. Uh, when I was compiling the kernel, I ended up having to take a, a, a small, like a little uh, 80 millimeter fan that I had to plug in the USB. And I actually opened the case up and I sat it. Just on the hard drive beside the uh, other right, and, like just was giving the passive V-Sync some active, and that worked great because it's a huge V-Sync. Um, but yeah, that that, that uh, little two two gigahertz package actually got down to 1.3 gigahertz. It was so hot. That, it kept scaling down and down, and I was like, oh god. And so, was that? The other the other seven from the top. It's actually the, the default, with the way that I've built it, uh, the default is the performance governor uh, in the kernel. Because uh, there's different governors you can use for performance or uh, power saving or different different things. And the one that's default is uh, is performance. But you can, you can change it. Uh, so the one that I, I, I built with uh, uh, was fun to, because I wanted to build as efficient as possible. I'm trying to make a very high efficiency box. I don't care that it takes a lot of time to compile and do different things to make the box more efficient. So if I can, even if it's like, oh, you're only gaining five or 10%, I'm still gaining five or 10%, all right? In a laptop or a desktop nowadays, that's not a huge deal. And so, like having to recompile your operating system every time you build it, or every time there's a big update, especially with the GUI and with your web browsers and your word processors and all that stuff, that's a big pain in the butt. But with this thing, there's no GUI, there's no browser web browsers, there's no word processors, nothing. So me updating the box is almost trivial. Like it's just a couple of packages here and there. And me being able to really drill down and say, I want it built for this processor. I want this type of optimization. I want these options on this package is valuable. And so with Fun2 or Gen2, Gen2 uh, Fun is a, uh, you can think of Fun2 kind of, I guess you could think of it kind of like uh, a flavor of Gen2. It's not, it's not as much of a flavor as Gen2 like Ubuntu is the Debian, but it's kind of like how they do the deployments and how some of their configurations and stuff are. But so as far as I can tell, it's a little more stable on how they uh, handle their, their deployments. They're a downstream of, of, uh, of Gen2, uh, but uh, I just, I never tried it before, so I figured I'd try it with Fun2. So, well, it's all right. What well, like, well, was anyway? In the world of embedded, people will worry about the three percent. Right. Like it's why this box is so popular because you can have one binary that you can symbolically link to everything, and this allows us to get back on L headers and get the score on the flash. 
There you go. Seems trivial, but it's not. Yeah. So it's, it's literally any sort of performance enhancement that you get, especially when you're getting into the song. Yeah. Worth it. Yeah. So I wanted, I, wanted, I wanted to try Funtune for a while because it was started by the guy that had started Gento originally. And um, I wanted to try it. I actually run Funtune on it. This is Funtune. Uh, and I'm kind of just messing around with it. Okay. And I might redo it as Gentoo at some point. I like Gentoo. Gentoo's fun. Um, it's a neat little project. Uh, Funtune's got some issues. Uh, Gentoo has some issues. They all have issues. But, um, yeah, I built fun too. So, uh, in the uh, OS build out, what I had to do, I actually started building it from scratch. They have fun to, I don't know if it's fun to or gen to. It's, uh, I don't know. Uh, fun to or gen to, actually, they're actually going to be both. But uh, I think there is actually both. But they have a page on how to build for the uh, uh, the X2 or the, uh, the X4, and it involves take the standard image, which for the X4 is Ubuntu, and rip these pieces out of it, and then put this uh, deployment on there, and then start doing the build. And I didn't like that. I wanted to bootstrap it. Like I wanted to do a basically a normal build. And start, so I started looking up Odroid's how to build an operating system. And it's very involved. And I was going through that and I was like, I want to build a process that people can follow to bootstrap an XU4 Gen 2, right? Or Gen 2 or Fun 2 or whatever. And it started getting really, really, really weird. And like I've never done any of the stuff that uh, they started uh, working through at the time, so there's like a bunch of. Uh, nice meet you guys. I gotta get out of here. Did you put this on the website? Yeah, it's it's already on the website. That's where that's where we're at. <laughs> uh, so with uh, with this system, it's you have to do these cross dev tools. These this cross compilation tools, and it starts getting very strange. I got to the point where I couldn't figure out some certain things about it, and I was getting to the point where like, I really wanted to get this project working, and I'm like, all right, I'm just gonna go ahead and go back and go to their method, and I'll come back to this. I'm gonna write down what I had accomplished, what I had figured out, where like the resources that I had found, and so that's why I have a go from scratch section, and there's actually like a system that will expand and so I have, like here's the product, like most of it's Linux Exynos. And Linux Exynos is where most of their material comes from, but it's like the Odroid and the Linux Exynos project are your resources for building this from scratch. So if you want to try doing this from scratch, there's your resources for doing this. Um, if you do it, let me know. I want to learn from that, or like how, how we, we get through some of the barriers and stuff. But, it was more of a simplicity thing. Well, like building it from scratch versus taking, like, flashing an operating system on it, stripping it out, reflashing another operating system on it, and like trying to basically do like 20 different things as opposed to just saying like, I have a Linux operating system, I install these tools, I do these things, and I'm done. So, like, yeah, keeps building. Frankenstein, really. Right, and so like the, the whole idea, like the way you would unitally install a Gen 2 install is I don't have to sit there and try to like boot it, do this to it, and then do that to it, and then reboot it, and then take the disk out, and then strip these files out of it, and then put these files onto it, and then re like make a different partition, and then put things into that partition, and that's what we're going to be doing. It's irritating, but it works. Uh, the way you usually do Gen 2 is you have, here's your disk, install. That's what I was trying to get to. But because of cross-dev tools and stuff, like where, where you're going from, like this is a x86 platform, that's an ARM platform, you can't directly 
code for where you can't directly compile for it. You have to have cross compiler and you have to do all the different stuff. And then on top of that, you're dealing with an SOC and a U-boot and a firmware that's all non, like it's not just like a normal computer, it's, it's very specialized. It's all, you know, like it takes a lot of knowledge that I just didn't have at the time. I'm gaining that. So now I've written the thing on, now that's on the internet on how to build a kernel for this. So, and thank you for your contribution. Because there was nothing like this out there, actually. This is yeah. Literally, it was brand new content for us. Yes, it's the first time I've written brand new content for the internet. So that's pretty neat. It took me a while. But. What <laughs> that means. What's that? What about cat memes? <laughs> you can put cat memes on it. Uh, what did you say? So you want the internet. <laughs> one, one, one internet. One internet. Um, Okay, so the fun two Gen 2 ways to pull Ubuntu and then flash that and then lay down a uh, fun two system. Alright, so first, uh, what, what I did is I went ahead and I just uh, I, I, I gave you a little uh, variable here. That way you can just change the variable instead of sitting there and having to change the code of the guys or be like, have to change out placeholders or anything crazy like this. Just change this to whatever your disk is. Mine was SDF at the time on my little Linux box I was dealing with. So, change yours to whatever. It's going to be SDB. Just don't probably make it SDA because you know, don't worry about your process. Um, Alright, so my disk is SDF. I'm going to go out, I'm going to grab the Ubuntu images all right, from Odril. Now, here, uh, I think up here, yeah, these two links, these are the image lists. So, this one is the one that I, I started with. This was the newest one I started with. Because I wanted the newest kernel, I wanted the newest drivers. Uh, but this is the list of images that they have for the Odroid uh, XU4. All right? And this is the official Odroid image. Uh, so there's where the images are, and then if you want to use the one that I'm using, that's where mine is. So you grab the image, grab the MD5 sum, you do a checksum on that just to make sure that the image is fully downloaded and that it passes its checksum. You should see that the checksum comes back okay. It doesn't for every downloading. Your XZ still doesn't try to be downloading your MD5 sum. But uh, they should match. If they don't, <laughs> check your network. Um, Decompress it. Actually, I haven't used XC almost ever. So I have to look that one up. Um, decompress uh, this, which will decompress the image. And then uh, uh, you have to do this as root. But DD that file, uh, the end file is the Ubuntu image. So Ubuntu, blah, 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 that image. And the out file is that disk. Okay, so your my disk variable. You just put the disk name if you want to, but the disk. Uh, and then sync. Now what sync does is it synchronizes, it flushes the uh, file system cache uh, and it, it synchronizes everything. When sync comes back, you can pull the disk, you're good. Um, so especially it's not mounted. So as soon as your sync comes back, you're good to go. You can pull that USB drive. But don't do this and then pull the disk because it could still be writing to the USB drive. Alright? Then, I do like, we're doing a lot of stuff as root, so I'm going to just be root. Um, and yes, yeah, on the post machine. Oh, we call the Odroid. Uh, you have to stick the card into the Odroid. Uh, I logged in, but I want to make sure the card worked and the Odroid worked. So I plugged the Odroid in. Remember what I was saying? Make sure your stuff works before you start messing with it. All right? Plug the card in, plug it out, like plug your old monitor, all the keyboard, all that kind of stuff in. Everything was running. Made sure the operating system I was using was running. The image was running. Everything was running right. Okay? So the Odroid worked. Root had reflashed itself to the full size of the card. It's just an automatic operation. It actually just reboots and does that in its own. So I gracefully shut down the box. I did a shutdown my SH now. Uh, which I put in there. And I grab the card out of it and plug, plug it back into my Linux host. My Linux host has roots. I mounted that disk on the mount, made a directory, 
and then I copy my mount lib modules and my mount lib firmware to my, my little temporary directory and my FS app. Okay? That's what we were basically, well, we were getting those and our firmware and some of the boot stuff from Ubuntu. We're basically going to destroy everything else. All right? The modules are your kernel modules. Firmware is your kernel firmware. FS tab is your file system table. And then the boot stuff will be getting done. So you unmount the mount directory. I uh, make a file system where we just work. And I gave it a label. I went ahead and gave it a label. So root FS, because we're going to mount it with the label as opposed to get the block ID. It's a lot easier to read. I mount. Uh, yeah, I remount that. So now what I've done is I've, I've mounted the Ubuntu image. I've stripped out what I needed from it. I've stripped out the modules, the firmware, the file system tab. I unmounted it, and then I annihilated it. Okay. I just wrote a new file system right over top of it because it resized the file system for me. Very nice of it. Goodbye. <laughs> and uh, so I just wrote a new file system over top of that partition uh, and remounted that. And I went into that mount point and grabbed the ARM 32 bit version of Ubuntu Stage 3 latest. Now they have a version for Odroid X4. So I pulled that down. And extract. All right. You want to make sure you have your key to preserve your um, all of your cases, so you have like all your files and submissions and stuff that are inside of the tarball preserved. If you don't do that, you're going to have all kinds of strange things, and eventually you might have a problem with the system working. Uh, you don't need the key though. It's very standard. Um, but you need to execute the app at least. Uh, then I'm going to copy my FS tab, my firmware, and my modules into its directories because I need those. I need that FS tab, the firmware, and modules. I like them, but if you like Nano or Emacs or whatever, expert editor is whatever you like. All right? Editor Etsy FS tab. Now this isn't slash Etsy FS tab. This is a local directory. This is just Etsy slash FS tab. This is the FS tab of the, of the thing that you're doing. And I went ahead and changed my labels to root FS and boot. Actually, I think that I only have to do root FS then. Yeah. But this is what it ends up looking like. It's root FS, root, PSD4, blah, blah, blah. But this is mostly the same. Then I want to change the root password. Now, since I'm not running the machine, and I can't ch root into it. The reason I can't ch root into it is because it's running a different architecture than I am. I have to change the password, but I can't ch root into it. So that means I have to generate a password with salt, <laughs> but I can't get in the machine. Make password. So make password dash m sha two five twelve. Type in the password. It gives you the password. You can salt it. Delete. Delete that. Um, and then use your editor. Edit that shadow file. The root. You do that. Go to the shadow file. Uh, replace the second field of root here. At the time, it was a star root. That means you can't log in. You reboot this. You try to log in as root. There's nothing that's going to work at all. So replace the star. Replace that with your string that you just got from this uh, command. All right. Now go to root's home. Unmount root. And uh, mount the first partition back. So we're going to go, if you just type cd and hit enter, that takes you back to your home directory. Or if you do cd tilde, it also takes you back to your home directory. Okay. You mount the mount directory, mount dev my disk one. Okay? So you're mounting the first partition to mount. Now I'm going to edit my mount boot ini. Okay? So we're preserving everything that Ubuntu gave us on the first file on the first partition. Okay. By the way, if you go to the to the Jackslug Twitter, you can get the link to this okay. wiki Jackslug. page. Yeah, twitter.com slash Jackslug. It's got the link to this wiki page. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, so we're 
going to edit not blue 99. And we're going to change this UUID. Well, we're going to basically change this line to this line. And if what we're going to do is, I believe it's just the UUID, so well, it's the console as well. Um, we'll basically just change this line to this line. It's a bunch of different options. We're getting rid of a bunch of them. We're changing the uh, root FS. We're changing or the, uh, the root location from a UUID specific to a label that's root FS. We're changing, we're adding a uh, console blank uh, zero so the console doesn't turn off on us. Um, getting rid of some of those options. I think uh, everything else is pretty much the same. So later on, I actually take a whole lot of options in that file. But suffice to say, we have to have that to to start this thing. At this point, we're good to go. You pop it back into the into the machine, reboot, you're good. You have a running fun two system. It's barely running, but it runs. Okay, you are a running functional XU4. At this point, you can do whatever you want to the XC4 here. You can build whatever you want. Like you don't want to follow this project anymore. You got to this point. Now you want to go build like a you know, emulator station or whatever on a phone too. Go for it. Works. All right. General setup. Now we have a basic running system. We want to set up some things that will allow us to do uh, stuff that we want. Uh, this is something we want to do generally on any system. Uh, I want to either set up a static IP address or a DHCP address. So static address uh, with fun to you link a template into a network in the etnet.d. I'm going to try to hurry this up. I'm trying to hurry as fast as I can, and you can hear my voice kind of going too. I'm sorry. This is a lot of material. I hope you guys are enjoying it. So, uh, good. Uh, so, etcnet.d, there are these templates in Funtu. In Gentoo, you do it differently. I actually, I kind of like Gentoo's way better. I tried to do it in Gentoo's way on some of the stuff, and you can kind of do it, but it gets weird. So, because some of the stuff like hosthd expects that you do it the Funtu way, and when you don't, it explodes. So, we'll get to that I later. It wasn't a ball. What's that? <laughs> oh, well, it virtually explodes. You can make it to a ball. <laughs> virtually. <laughs> but it's semicolon where, where a pasta we should be. Right, right. <laughs> so, etcnet.d, inside of this, your netif.template, you're going to uh, link that to net.s0. Okay, so we want our, our network there. And then we're going to edit that. All right. Which doesn't seem like something I would want to do because it's a link. I'd have to think about that. I would actually want to say probably copy that to that, not to link it. I'm going to have to go look, look, look at what I did there. <laughs> I might have got a whoopsie. Um, so this guy, uh, this doesn't exist anymore anyway, but uh, this guy, uh, you, you add this, temp so the template interface, I might have explained some of the weirdness I was all about. Whoa, hey, look, I found it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always letting the drum shoot here. Oh, is that why? Oh, yeah. Oh, there's some weird stuff. We didn't know we were doing code review, did you? Like when you when you build an operating system over like a month, <laughs> and you're like going back and forth down different like aisles and you've never done it before. Oh yeah, they you get weird stuff. Sometimes. Like as much as you can document, you still miss stuff. Uh, but anyway, because I don't just come up with this stuff. It's I'm following their documentation, and their documentation is inconsistent. Yeah. Like they tell you to do it one way. Like, I, they told me to do it like this, this net.s0. And then later on, when I was building host AP, it's like, where's my net if? And I eventually said, well, I'm like looking through the code in host AP startup scripts, and it's hard coded to look for net if dot interface. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I could recode that, which will probably at some point just get overwritten by an update. Or I could just redo the interfaces to be the standard yeah. of one standard of two standards. <laughs> Let me go look at, yeah, yeah, their documentation says do it this way in one and do it the other way in the other. <laughs> so later on I have that little comment in there as well. But I, I, I specify my IP address, my gateway, my name servers, 
and then an RC update add net, that net zero default. What this is, RC update is the Gen 2 way of updating a, uh, or setting up your startup services add uh, uh, device or well, service and level, so default. Uh, lots of things. Uh, that's another reason I went to fuck it. Uh, DHCP address, very easy. Turn on DHCP CD. DHCP CD is very strange. I've never actually seen it work like this one before. But it will grab all available addresses that are up and try to do DHCP on them. <laughs> I don't like that. I can find a way around it, but the way that they have to do around it for like host AP and bridging and all that kind of stuff is to manually go into the configuration and literally say, deny ever using those interfaces. I don't like that either, because I want to be able to sometimes use them. I would rather have a whitelist than a blacklist. Yes. So, I'll figure out a way around that at some point, but yeah. Uh, yeah, you turn that thing on and you up the interface, it will just grab the AC. If I remember correctly, I think you can actually pass a switch to it to specify one interface. I don't know. Uh, in Gen 2, I think it's called Gen 2 Switch. Yeah. DACP, you can you set up the interface and you tell it, hey, I want you tell it, I want you to configure this interface, I want you to configure it with DACP. This one, I want you to turn on DACP. For what? I want you to turn on DACP. Right. Uh, <laughs> this is literally on like this is the process that they have on their site. Is to turn on DACP and run RC, which Turns on the piece. They're assuming you only have one interface. Right. Well, I mean, this is assuming uh, physical interface. I mean, there's probably, like, later on in the document, it's doing my thing. Um, okay, so now that we're connected to the network, we want to synchronize, we want to get our updates. Eco is uh, the way that they do synchronization. They have uh, eMerge, like Gentoo, but uh, the way that they do profiles versus the uh, different stuff. Uh, we want to do ego as opposed to uh, emerge for your synchronization. So you do ego sync, it'll synchronize everything, it uses get as opposed to our sync. Uh, so ego sync, uh, and then I edit my make.conf. These are the options that I put in my make.conf. Now make.conf is arguably the most important file on your Gen 2 system, mm -hmm. all right? Because this is what defines what your Gen 2 system is. All right, this is what defines your, your architecture, what is going on inside of your Gen 2 system or your Fun 2 system. All right. These are my optimizations. Now I had to look these up because I don't know all these things. And you know, figuring some of these out is just, uh, I, you have to know some of the internals of the CPU, you have to understand like, how the CPU works, some of the floating points, like you have to actually like, well, this CPU has this type of floating point chip. Okay, well, it's a VC, it's a FPV4. Okay, well then, my MFPU is a neon VFPV4. I didn't know that. I'm sure there's a way that you can look it up inside of like the ROM file system. But, I don't know. So I looked it up. This is what they suggest on the Gen 2 uh, page for the X4 is you do your C host as this, and your C flags as these. This is where you're optimizing this. Your O2 is your optimization, your pipe is your pipe, your architecture, your tuning, your FPU, and your flows. Your C flags, your CSX flags are the same as your C flags. Your make ops is the number of threads that it will attempt to compile things with when it's compiling things with the version. So here, doing eight, I have eight processors. Now I've heard that, I've heard some, I've seen some things on the forums where they say, ah, I should maybe max it out at like four or five because you start hitting uh, memory bottlenecks at four or five. I've been, hitting, I've been doing eight, it seems to work okay. Here we go, I'm trying to figure it out. Uh, use, these are global use files. So if you really like GTK, read GTK, I wouldn't. Um, but if you want positives, negatives, if you never, ever, ever, ever want to see KDE on your system, go to minus KDE. Okay? That's what use like, the global use flags are for. Is to always have something or never have something. 
Otherwise, we'll put this somewhere else. Emerge default ops. That's one that one of my friends showed me a long time ago. And it's almost never talked about anywhere. I don't know why. They always say, type AV every time you write Emerge. Why? Put it as an Emerge default op. It's great. I never have to type it. All right? So I just say Emerge, whatever. And I always get AV. It asks and it's verbose every time. It's fantastic. Except license star. If you really don't care that Flash has a different license than Linux, put that on there. If it's in the repo, you'll get it. If it's not in the repo, you won't get it. If you have that, you might have to go in and edit a whole bunch of files and tell it, yes, I accept the license. Now just give me the thing. For a lot of stuff. Uh, not, not, that, not that many things, but it's still your thing. Uh, but if you do care about licenses, this may be a thing. If you have a system that you care about licenses, like a work system or different things like that, you may not want to have that on Full full code or whatever. Right. Then I installed HTOP. If you haven't used HTOP, HTOP is great. You should use it. Oh, yeah. It's like top, but it's pretty. When I have updated the world, uh, so all the packages on the system updated those. So RP Emerge UDN, I didn't have to do my A or my B at world. Yeah. Updates all of my packages. The N is Gradle flag. It looks for differences in the flags or the uh, uses. And the, what, it looks for differences. And if there are differences in, I believe, the use variables, it will repose even if it's the same version. So, inverts that, it recompiles everything. Now you have a fully updated system. And you can uh, do this where you watch this thing. Now, I actually show you how to write this script down here. Okay. Uh, the CPU stats.sh is a script that I wrote. Uh, this script just caps these CPU frequencies and this thermal zone temperature. This thermal zone temperature is uh, we're basically we're using these sys devices to see. What, how hot, because on your, on your XU4, I saw like uh, the distro you're using had a really neat little splash page, and it had like the frequency it was running at, and the heat, and I'm like, I want that. I wonder if they have a script, and they don't put out the script, and I don't remember what thing you were using, and I was just like, oh, I, I want that information. The script that you want. But if there, please, there, there is, there was like one zone of the CPU thing, it's kind of like, an average of the actual of the cores you can actually get cores individually. That there was one zone that was actually supposed to be an average. I think that's this one. Yeah. Zone zero. So yeah, I think it's zero, and then I think there was another one that counted the fact the so your two gigahertz and then your one point four gigahertz. Yeah. Was, um, well actually there's like one that's like a pseudo uh design group. Kind of like average. I can shoot you the script. And yeah, yeah, I'd love, I'd love to have the script, but, right. but I wrote this because I didn't have it. Okay. Uh, so I went in and I figured out what the devices are. And um, I, there's a thermal zone. So sys devices, virtual thermal, thermal zone zero temp. So I find, found out that that's uh, one of the temperature probes. I believe it's one of the average temperature probes. And then uh, sys devices system CPU, CPU zero through seven. CPU free, CPU info current frequency. And so I can see if it's throttle. Right? And so what I did is I catted each one of these and then I truncated the slash n, or I translated the slash n to a space. And so, um, so I translated those that slash n to a space and that just gives me a line of temperatures and uh, speeds. And then I save five and put a return character and then I'm done. And so I can see this uh, speed and watch runs it every two seconds uh, and just clears the screen. So I, it runs this, then it tails that, which is an emerge log, and then that gives me the uptime to make sure I like, see what my load average is. And there we go. <coughs> 
how you set up your, si your time zone, your host name of your system. Uh, set up your time zone, you just link SF, which is going to just force the other one out. Uh, user share zone info, five via uh, PST5 UET, so we have time zones, or uh, uh, switching time, unfortunately, still because the sun is different at different times of the year. You guys see old candles and things. And so, uh, it's a time, local time, so we can have our local time, and then change your host name, because we like our host names to be not local host. Uh, go to yourself user, user at dash in user name, go to password. Because you don't like logging in this root. Do not log in this root every time, Cali users. All right. But, but, you know. Finally, set up yourself a nice MOTD by editing an anti MOTD and reboot. So, VI as the message of the day. Put something in there. Remove what's there. Make something neat. Reboot. Everything's great. Okay? That is the end of the general setup that you need to do for this. These are the applications that uh, I set up for this. Uh, we're running pretty late right now, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell you the applications I put on there. And I, actually, most of these are just the config files. So we're, we're done with most of the uh, other stuff. So we'll, we'll be able to be done here in the next like, five minutes. Um, so NFS utils, you want to have your NFS file, that's where you go. Part it, if you like file systems that are, or you want to edit a disk that's bigger than four terabytes, you need to part it. Or GFS, or you know, there's lots of different programs. HDPAR, HDPAR is useful for editing or checking out uh, hard drives. F tool, checking out Ethernet status. VNstat, if you want to see the uh, status of the uh, interface and the statistics. Cron data, you want crony. Inlocate, five files on the file system. Uh, IW, uh, wireless network configuration utility. WPA sub allows connecting the encrypted access points. Host APD allows you to build access points themselves. Vim, I like that. Uh, you might not like that. It's an editor. It's a, uh, SysKLogD, a system logger name. Uh, I like having a system log. It's useful to have a syslog. Uh, log rotate, that's also very useful to have. That doesn't come with this. Uh, wireless tools, you should have those as well. S-trace, I was having some problems on some systems. You should probably grab that as well. Uh, wireless client, this is how I set up the wireless client. You have WPA suffocate. You have config for the WPA suffocate. Your config consists of a control interface, update config, which allows the uh, tool, the WPA config tools, to interact with it. We're in the country US. Network and SSID, you can have an SSID or PSK. You don't have to have the PSK if it's an open network. So if you're setting up this for an open network, just leave out that PSK. All right? Uh, you can get this uh, using the WPA subkit uh, password. You can look that up online. Uh, the configuration, this is that stuff right there. Uh, my network configuration, I set this one up like Gentoo. This is what a Gentoo set up, uh, network setup looks like right here. So you can see how it's a little bit different. Um, and then my WPA supplicant uh, configuration, so etsyconf.d WPA supplicant, I have to put these arguments in. Uh, basically pointing it at that uh, configuration file right at the top. And then I did my RC update at WPS subcut default, and that added it to the run level, which allowed me to also add uh, that WLAN plan WLAN 0 default and the DHCPC. And there you go. Now it starts on boot. It can actually wireless that with my choice. Also, if I wanted to uh, connect to any open access point, I can set it up like here, where I say network, and I don't specify an SSID, key management none, priority negative 999. You can set these up with the priorities as well. And if it can't get any of the ones that I've set up specifically, it will just connect to any of the open ones. Okay, now, that <laughs> is how I set this one. Because I'm going to a bunch of public places, and I want it to connect to so if it's not
not connecting to one that I've set up. Now, I might remove this config later. It depends on how I'm figuring out how things are set up. But if it can't find the ones that it's trying to connect to, it will try to connect to the one that's open. Um, right. um, uh, this is, I'm not going over this. We have no time to go over this. This was very, very difficult. And you should read this if you want to. I did a lot of work on this, and this was like, this was days of work to figure all this stuff out. Yes, sir? I have like several questions. <laughs> so many questions. Can we hold it off to the lush? <laughs> oh, well, uh, uh, go ahead. Like, are they quick? Uh, yeah, it's yeah. like several really quick questions. Okay, what's up? How adaptable would it be to write like a wall sheet, the author, like all the stuff like you would use for like pen testing and use wireless monitor, packet injection adapters, and perhaps like something like a land terminal interface? Or This is just a device selection. Right. So we're building an operating system. Those things are those are programs. And so you would have to, to install and configure those programs just like you would do any other program. So just like you I'm installing host AP, I'm installing like uh, DHCP services and DS services, you would have to install the services that you're trying to do. Right. So I guess what I'm saying, I don't know. I have never installed those types of things. I guess what I'm saying is with the hardware that's there, it should be able to run all those things. How hard would it be to? It should be. Right. To wireless chipsets and Linux are very, very frustrating. Right. That's why you use like an Alpha. But my question is, how hard would it be to write like a custom ISO that has all of that built-in proprietary if you just fire up that particular flavor or modified distro that you can just get right into, click the button, and have your utilities right there, and it launches.
we're not really going to go over this. I'll go over the, the sticking points. Um, first thing, Overit has its own kernel. They have a branch of their own kernel. And you can go to their GitHub to get their kernel, and they have all their versions that they deploy. Inside of their kernel, they actually have configs for each one of their devices. So they have a pre-configured uh, dot config for each one of their device types. That is an extremely valuable piece of information. That sounds heavenly. That <laughs> is almost nowhere that I can find. It. So, just know about that. That's where that is. This is where I got my kernel from. Clone it with get. You link it in. This is where my current configs are. I guess it's actually going to be pretty easy to go through the current because it took me a long time to build it, but it's actually fairly simple once you know what's going on. Configs, this is the default config for that. I just pulled in the config. Now you can still change it. You can go in and edit the config all you want, but this is the default that will work for the XC4. You make menu config if you want to go in and mess around, or you can just look at the config. You make it. We do a modules install that installs the modules back in that lib modules directory that we copied from Ubuntu. So now it has a new one with the new kernel. All right. Now we have to make the NRD package. So now we have the modules. Now we have the kernel. Now we actually have to have the image and the in the uh, in the RAM. <coughs> so I went ahead and just made a little, a little variable for everybody. And I said, here's our version. And you get that version from inside of the kernel. I'll tell you how to do that there. Uh, I had to grab drag cut and new boot tools. That took me a while to find too. Drag cut allows you to build the image, and new boot tools allows you to compress the image for the new boot, which is a specialized system on that side. You see the image boot, you copy the Z image, which is the, this is the actual kernel that you just built, into, you can name it whatever you want, but I just named it the particular kernel version of the date that I built it uh, there. And then you use drag cut to build a gzips and NRD off of that. And you know, make an image, you use make image, which is part of the new boot and you make your view and NRD from that. And you deploy it. And those are all very specialized things that are really great for what like. Once you have that, now you have a usable, bootable kernel that you built for the X4. Then here's the, uh, the boot.ini again with a whole bunch of options. Customize it whatever way you want. I'm not going to Bunch of stuff. All kinds of new stuff. You can set up frequencies. Here's module blacklisting. I had a problem. Right here, this guy, PID 1022, he was running at 100% CPU. <laughs> I ran him for a couple of days. Look at that. <laughs> so this thing, I had no idea what it was. I couldn't, I ran S trace against it. I couldn't figure out why. I, I, I mean, I don't know what the hell it was. That I could not figure out. How, well, it started when, when I went to hack it up as he did. And I, I could not, for the foggiest, figure out what it was. Well, I eventually figured out that ADS7846 is a driver. And it flipped the hell out for some reason. And uh, the driver is for touch, some kind of a touch interface. So, that, so that's why it wasn't wanting to work right when we right. had kind of yeah. That driver is why it didn't work right. And so the network infrastructure worked, every, all the routing was working perfectly, everything was working, except this thing was breaking it somehow. And so I figured that out, and so I did it, I removed the module, and everything worked. Like, so I blacklisted it. Goodbye, you don't come back. Uh, is that what it is? A different touch screen? Sorry, Ada. Uh, but yeah, the, uh, this, device, this driver was really, uh, really messing with us. So yeah, uh, that's building kernel and blacklisting a device. Cool. Setting up bridging. Bridging is great. I'm bridging device zero and at WLAN one together so that uh, 
the physical network and the host AP network that we're combining have the same interface for DHCP. They sit together. That way everybody has the same network. If you get on the wireless LAN or if you get on the physical LAN, you can talk to each other, you get the same services, all that kind of stuff. Makes everything simple. Everything is bridged in the BR0. <coughs> this is how you would do it. I'll let you guys read that later. Host APD, if you want to set up an access point using a wireless card, this is what an example config of how you would do that. I'm going to actually need to enhance this because there, I've left uh, some of the configuration stuff or like how you would install it, that kind of stuff off of this. But yeah. DNS mask, again, I've given you a config, uh, but not too much other information than that. But uh, in this, if you go to these addresses, this is kind of a fun little thing. Uh, what I have is I have interface of PR0, I have the bro interface, it's the bridge zero. Um, it's going to advertise over the bridge and it's going to give your range is 10, 10, 10, 100 to 230, it's going to give it an hour, which is the time. Uh, and then for any of these addresses, so Jack's 2600 at land, 2600 Jack's at land, Jack's at land, land, Hacket FSCJ at land, and Jack's DLOG at land, it will point it at itself. And so if you go to any address or any subdomain address of any of these domains, it will point at that box. So if we have like hosted content or whatever, you can just be like, go to jackslug.land. It's there every time, all right? Other than these addresses, if you go to anything else, it just forwards it on. It's like, don't have that, and it just sends it along. Google in there. Right. Well, you could. You could. If I wanted to put Google in there, any any address and any subdomain address would go to whatever address I wanted. We did that in the hacker space. So I'm doing higher 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 domain and stuff like that. Now I actually do manipulate that as well. I have uh, something called Steve of Black's host file, and I populate. I actually, um, that might be on the to do list. Uh, but there's a uh, host file. I do it at my house. That's very good. But there's a thing called Stephen Black's host file, and I'm intending on doing it here if I haven't already. Um, but basically, I can block adware, spyware, viruses, um, bad, bad stuff, bad domains, all kinds of good things, good. and I can block them here. So even if you have a virus and it tries to call home, you're like, what do you want me to do? It hits the browser and just like docs. And just, it just can't get out. And so yeah. even if things are there and they're trying to propagate, it can't. Yeah. How secure is the, uh, the changing the DNS table? I'm thinking about I'm doing a speech on parental controls, and I'm suggesting that people set up open DNS with content filtering. How so easy is that to get around? Uh, DNS is a simple way of doing a normal block. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with doing something like for kids or something like that is if the kid's smart enough and they understand how the computer works, one, uh, let's just say that I know the address I'm trying to get to. I know the IP address. You just go there. Yeah. You don't need to do this. Yeah. Two, um, one of the things that you can do as well is you don't have to use the DNS of the machine. So if one thing I can do to prevent this is I can actually block port 53 when I'm doing that. But I could specifically block port 53. So if you don't want to use my DNS server, you don't have to. Yeah. You can use DNS if you want. But unless you are sitting there blocking, now that's one thing you can do for a wireless control, is you can say, here's the DNS service you can use. So you can use, like, here's all of open DNS servers, and any other DNS request is not allowed. Yeah. All other servers are not allowed. Oh, port 53 for. Right, you can close four fifty three all other requests, and that's the way you can shuttle them in. Other than that, they would have to have um, they, the, no, the knowledge of what IP address that that was is, and, and then they have to put it into their host file. Or just have a VPN or, or have to VPN or SSH file four fifty three or whatever. Right. Then they have to start doing really tricky stuff to get out. Uh, but they wouldn't be able to just be like, oh, my my new name server is over there. You yeah. know? Uh, so this is our uh, DNS mask configuration. Pure FTP, I did a little research. I was thinking, I liked uh, Pure FTP. It's really like old hat, like I did that a long time ago. It has a lot of bugs, like a lot, lot of bugs. Then I was like, oh, maybe very secure FTP. It's 
That one has a lot of bugs, too. Apparently, pure FTP is one of the most secure ones because, like, people keep doing audits and it's like, code base is pretty good on this one. So, yeah, so pure FTP, pretty decent, apparently. So, as I set up, I haven't really gone, like, that's the setup right now. It'll get changed eventually, but. Like I gotta kind of go through it, but uh, there's a lot. I, I don't even know what anti weirds does. There's metal UIDs. And there's a CA through everyone, which is actually a really nice thing. But that doesn't allow you to like have symbols that go outside. So like if I CA through everyone, and then I say, well then go over to this hard drive over here. It can't get there because it has to traverse down and back up. We won't be able to ever get there. Um, what? So where is the legal software? Well, I know what wears is. Right? <laughs> I don't know what pure FTP's definition of anti wear is, what this function is. Well, security. I don't think. Oh, this is the legal software. You can't FTP. How, how does it know? It's, 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 it's probably some kind of behavior. It's probably some kind of a behavioral thing. Um, then we have Whitey. Uh, what's up? I have a question. I'm sorry, yes. When are you going to do a land party with this thing? So we can we're doing one right now. When you go into his house. <laughs> but, uh, I have plugged in, but I didn't know what to do with it. Okay, well, uh, maybe this next time, or we'll go to the Lush, and I'll actually have this again. I brought my portable battery here, which is neat. I also wanted to show you guys that too, but it's heavy. Or it's not heavy, but it's just an extra battery. It's carrying a projector too. Um, but uh, yeah, we're going to do the Lush, and I'm bringing this thing in if you guys want to screw around with it, and uh, you've got the battery thing as well. So, we got lighting. Lighting is a good uh, old light uh, ACP van. Uh, I have figured where it also CHRs everyone to keep everybody from outside of like the network. I don't want them or into, into the internals of the machine. I don't want them all, you know, traversing my internals. And so, keep them out of that, but I let them use certain things. And uh, I also let them do uh, directory management. So, uh, yeah. Services. These are the services I have starting on boots. I'll probably do a little bit of an update on like how you can use RC update. And uh, that. that's the end of that section. There's one more small section and then we're done. These are customizations I found to be very, very useful. Um, I edited an Etsy profile. And I added, I added my editor, so I added, at the end of it, I added editor equals Venom. If you really like Nano, add editor equals Nano. If you really add Emacs, which I've never actually found anybody that does. Does anybody like Emacs? No. Anybody that's not joking, you really like Emacs? No, okay, apparently Emacs is its own operating system. I don't know, I've never really used it. I've gotten into it accidentally once or twice. I'm like, oh God, how do I get out? And I've, like, I've had to like control Z and then try to like kill the process. <laughs> That's funny because that joke is usually not big. <laughs> I like it, but I mean, I do. I mean, it's it's what I use all the time. It's, it's great. And I tell you, I tell you, true story. I, I use Vim so much that I don't do it much anymore. But it used to be, I got so used to Vim that I'd go over to Windows machine and I'd edit something in the middle path that I would just instinctively get escape. To say the it didn't work. I do that on Nano so many times whenever I'm like at a friend's house or if I'm doing it on some default system. I'm like, because they always default it to Nano. I'm like, you know, colon WQ. Whoops, I wrote that. Colon WQ. I did it again. X. <laughs> Alright, so uh, yeah, you can change your default editor that way. Great. You can also change a whole bunch of things. It's fantastic. Uh, just be careful. Um, also, some things don't seem to work on the Odroid. Like I have two hard drives in here, and they're supposed to mount at boot. They don't. I think it's because it's booting too fast. It's very strange. That, that EMMC is really fast, and so is this the SOC on it, the SOC, the system on chip. So this thing boots in like 10, 15 seconds. It's just there. It's like it's very, very fast. And I think it's actually faster then the hard drives can spit up. So the, the process to, 
to mount the hard drives is faster than the hard drives can actually initialize and then, and then get onto the USB bus and then the USB bus can initialize. And, and so the steps to actually get to where they're available to the operating system to mount, the operating system's already up. And so I had to actually add a reboot step that sleeps 10 seconds and then does a mount all, which was a little strange. Um, and I also made a little script that goes in and tells the hard drive not to sleep and not to have a uh, uh, not to have a spin down. That still doesn't work, so I actually ended up having to do. I, I made a script that every two two minutes uh, pokes a file on the hard drives to keep them awake. I didn't actually put that in there yet. But uh, VM Stat is a great tool. Eventually, I have a web page with it on there. It'll actually do uh, graphs. It'll show you a little thing. You can make little pretty graphs and stuff. Um, but uh, this will be really inform good information for like you know you go like hey everybody wants to grab like you know videos off of the hard drive and stuff and you can see like hey look you know here's all these graphs and it's not going to show you what people downloaded but it's going to show you like you know, it's not going to show you who or why but it'll show you just data transferred on this device. This much, so I can say like, oh yeah, a whole bunch of people grab stuff off of the wireless land, and then a whole bunch more people grab stuff off of the physical land because it's the more sane land. Right? So yeah, cool. You're cool. Uh, turn on Chrome and Syslog D. Those are really important. Uh, maintaining, you want to back up your box. You can do it with DD. You can do it with uh, like RSync. You do you know, whatever you want. Uh, restoring DD again or RSync, whatever you want to do. I would suggest DDing it or anything like if you took some, something like this over to um, like DEF CON or something like that where it's arguably you're probably going to get hacked. Um, even no matter how secure your system is, you're probably going to get hacked. Uh, you should probably make an image of your machine, change your password, change your passwords on it, make an image, of, well, make an image, change your passwords. Take anything off of there that you really want, and then take it, and then when you get back, wipe the machine and restore the image, because uh, that's that's a thing. Wipe, wipe. And then uh, make sure you update it occasionally. Now, keeping up to date packages is the number way, one way of not getting that, you know, not opening up all your services and having your password be password. Uh, and it's a project cost. Of that's how you can power it off. Uh, powering it off, you log into it and you do a shutdown, just like a normal machine. There's no power button. Uh, well, actually, there is a power button inside. I can actually open it and tap it, but um, you know, I'll just log in. So like, uh, I'll do that right now. Actually, come on there. So log in. I'm actually already root. I was going to show you guys stuff, but we are very long in the tooth. I am very sorry. I know this is a lot of material. I tried to run it through as fast as I could, and I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Uh, and we're going to do a shutdown. Let's see. Anybody pulling stuff? You say, no, nope, nobody's pulling anything. Okay. Well, at least not over the physical. So we're going to just shut down. That's H now. All right. So that's how you shut it off. And it'll shut off in probably five or six seconds. You, you can actually get a hard drive spin out of there. And uh, there you go. You just pull it and unplug the power through it. Uh, so hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Uh, I've been working on it for a while. I'm going to continue working on it. I'm going to be adding more services. We'll probably do another presentation later on with the additional services. And um, yep, wireless just went down. So uh, thanks for coming out.